absolutely delighted to be talking with Ian Sutherland this afternoon. Good afternoon, Ian. How are you? And a warm welcome. Good afternoon, Jeremy. I'm delighted to be here uh, talking to you across the big pond. Absolutely. I am, I'm in St. Louis at the moment. Whereabouts are you, Ian? Whereabouts are you? I live now in the south of England. Um, my next pet. <laughs> Just like yourself, but um, you know, it, it was a thing in my generation that, that uh, people in Scotland who began to make some particular headway in some particular professions, particularly in music and the arts and theatre, of course, if you wanted to. Uh, at least reach the big time you had to go to London and of course I have lived in England ever since absolutely absolutely well I'm very grateful to you for your time you are an incredibly talented esteemed musician conductor arts yeah. supporter and your career is is just incredible I actually don't know where to begin I don't know where to well, begin. <laughs> I don't want to sound cheeky, but let's begin at the beginning. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. That sounds like a good place to start. Would you share with us, please, your introduction to the world of music, please, Ian? Well, I was born and brought up in Glasgow, in a Glasgow tenement. Uh, my father was Canadian-Irish. And my mother was a real Highlander, born in the Isle of Mull, uh, to a large family of Gaelic speakers. So I grew up with this uh, uncles and aunts and all sorts of big grandparents, all talking Gaelic all the time. Uh, and uh, have had this enormous love of Gaelic culture and Gaelic songs and poetry ever since. But that gave me the opportunity to start off as a little boy, as a singer, because I was entered into the mod. Do you know what the mod is? I've heard a lot about it. Could you tell our audience, please? It still goes to this very, very day. It, it's an organisation. It, it, the organisation is in common dialogue. Uh, and in common dialogue, which means the Gaelic community, uh, have this competition every single year and have done so for over a century, where they have competitions, singing, piping, fiddling, dancing, etc, etc. But I won the junior competition when I was eight years of age. So I was entered for the classical musical festival as a result of that singing a song by Schubert called Hark Hark the Lark and I won that and as a result of that part of the prize was the opportunity to sing on the BBC children's program uh, called Children's Hour. So my parents <laughs> were told after that that I seemed to show some talent and perhaps they better send me to music lessons. Well, that's really how it started. Absolutely. And your, your parents, um, as, as passionate um, people about the arts themselves, do you feel that was uh, central to your development and your, your access to opportunities, the, the support of your parents? Well, they were avid readers, of course, and uh, onwards and upwards what was the only way to go. You know, we were we weren't poverty stricken, you know, but living in a in a Glasgow tenement, uh, I didn't I didn't actually you know have an indoor toilet until I was ten years of age when we actually moved out to the suburbs of Glasgow where my father managed to get a better 
better accommodation for us. Because my parents had actually met in Canada. My mother was part of that uh, Gaelic uh, uh, crowd, you know, who emigrated around about that time in the 20s and the 30s. There was a huge emigration which had started with the clearances the century before. And uh, they got married in Canada. They were married in Montreal. But my mother, with this large family back in Scotland, suffered terribly from um, homesickness. So back they came to Scotland, back to Glasgow. Of course, this was all new to my father. And uh, as you know, in the middle 30s, the UK was stricken with terrible unemployment, poverty. And that was what I found myself being uh, born into. But with, but with parents who had very, very uh, well educated and, and high hopes for the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Is Scotland always having its uh, great belief in the, the power of education as a, a means to, to move ahead? Well, as you know, Jamie, you know, a, a, a Scottish education <laughs> is, well, it's certainly reputed to be the best in the world. Absolutely. And when when did the, the transition into um, playing violin uh, begin as well, Ian? Well, that, that's part of the story. Uh, when, when my father was told you know, that I ought to have music lessons because there seemed to be some talent there, um, he couldn't afford to buy a piano. <laughs> so we bought a fiddle <laughs> and uh, I began to take violin lessons at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music in Glasgow and you know, I took to it like a, a duck to water. I started entering competitions once again uh, like the singing competitions I had entered and uh, I found myself by the time I was 11 years of age having Glasgow Music Festival this time in the Junior Violin Solo Center back on Children's Hour playing on the radio the uh, Sonatina in D by Schubert and later th this continued throughout my school career school orchestra all of that kind of thing and by the time I was 16, I was the leader, the, the principal violin, in the Glasgow School Symphony Orchestra. And I made my concerto debut with them playing the Bach A minor violin concerto. So as soon as I left school, I was immediately offered a, a scholarship to go on and study at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music full time. And so it rolled on and rolled on. I got my diploma, um, I left for London, I auditioned, I became a member of the Philharmonia Orchestra, London Symphony Orchestra, and eventually I became a very successful, what we call, session violinist. Uh, that's as well as playing in the symphony orchestra, I played in the big recording studios, particularly the movie studios. And uh, from that, I got the feeling that if I didn't make another move, these moves that I had made ever since I was eight years of age, um, I was very successful as a violinist, but I wanted more. So I formed my own orchestra and I got in touch with the BBC and said that um, I, I was you know, very fond of the light music programs on the BBC and they required freelance orchestras to fill all the slots for light music on the radio. So I took an audition with my orchestra. Of course I made sure that all these wonderful musicians that I had played with 
in the session orchestras in the studios were all in my orchestra. And we passed through the audition, of course, of Flying Colors. As a result of this, the BBC said to me that they would be prepared to offer me a permanent role as a conductor with the BBC if I was prepared to move back to Scotland because the BBC Scottish Orchestra was looking for a new conductor. So by this time I was married with three little boys and uh, we just up sticks and moved back to Glasgow and uh, I had a wonderful, wonderful seven years with the BBC Scottish Radio Orchestra until once again I got the call thinking to myself, if I don't leave Scotland now and get back to London, I'll never really find out whether I'm any good or not. And I uh, just told my wife and my three little boys that we were going back to London. Of course, my three little boys all spoke with Scottish accents by that time. And by the time they went to school in London, you know, they found themselves getting bashed up in the playground for oh, no. their funny accents. <laughs> Uh, help them to grow up, of course. amazing um, transformative um, experiences as a, as a very young gentleman, uh, as a musician. Was it a natural progression into then um, working as a conductor and inspiring other musicians? Well, to, you know, to get into this um, 
world of great music and light music. It, one of the things that, that I have always been, I, I think it may have had something to do with, with, the, with the love of the Gaelic music, you know, I learning so many old Gaelic songs that my mother made, you know, that um, I really do love the sound of all music makers. Uh, you know, whether it's a, a military band marching you know, down Whitehall, or, or whether it's a pipe band in Edinburgh, or whether it's one of the big American big bands like Count Basie or Duke Ellington, people making music, uh, choirs, and of course, right at the top of the tree is the symphony orchestra playing the great classical music. Unfortunately, throughout the world, listening to classical music and going to classical concerts has somehow been tied up with a class system. You know, if you went to symphony concerts, you know, somehow you were upper class, which is absolute nonsense. Um, and that's a thing that has to be broken down because it works on both sides. Um, about 10 years ago, I was invited to take part in a debate at the Oxford University Union. And the debate was this house, I can't remember exactly how it was put, but this house believes pop music is as important as classical music. And the people on the house side, uh, both the undergraduates and the stars that they had invited uh, to talk for pop music, uh, were, were, it was very, very impressive indeed. Of course, I was talking against the motion. Uh, I think it's ridiculous to say that uh, no matter how good, say, Paul McCartney is, you know, <laughs> it's not Mozart, you know. Um, but I'm very, very sorry to say that we actually lost the motion. The undergraduates of Glasgow, of, of the Oxford University 10 years ago, who will now all 10 years later have top positions in the BBC and in, in commercial television and radio and records and everything else, will have taken their their uh, attitude with them. So when I say it works on both sides, it's all very well for the classical music people to derive pop music, but it's e equally, equally bad for pop people to derive classical music. And if more of them could be like me, I mean, I can remember hearing uh, the great Duke Ellington say that um, apart from an American band, you know, like his own band and the Camp Daisy band and people like that, who could swing, the only other two musical units in the world who could also swing was a Viennese orchestra playing waltzes and a Scottish pipe band playing marches. Now, how about that? Absolutely brilliant. I mean, you certainly can't fail to be moved by it. Um, no, it is, it's very interesting, um, you know, in terms of how society views um, mm -hmm. particular music as being of a, you know, a higher culture or, or of a lower culture when yes. really the, these kind of um, perceptions only encourage um, people to, you know, stay, stay away because they think it's not for them. It's, that's not for us, that's not for us yeah. sort of idea, whereas music is for everybody and it should yeah. be for everybody um, and yeah, it is very interesting to wonder where that kind of classist thing comes from um, towards well, um, It does music. take a certain you know, educational level you know um, <clears throat> when I was taking part in that, in that particular debate 
I, I, I baited <laughs> the undergraduates on the other side of the house by talking about literature. You know, would they make the same decisions about literature? You know, was um, would would they would they make a comparison, say, between Charles Dickens and you know someone who, who had written the, the latest episode of the latest soap opera? <laughs> it's a great that's comparison. Doing, that's exactly what they were doing in music. Uh, I mean, I just it was difficult for them to see that. Oh, you see, here was I was talking to Oxford London graduates about uh, great literature, but they couldn't see the the differentiation in talking about music in the same way. Glasgow, left the BBC in Scotland, and I came back to London. The BBC in London immediately snapped me up again, and uh, for the next 30 years, I was the principal conductor of the BBC Concert Orchestra in a program called Friday Night is Music Night. Now, the, the, the title explains what it's all about. I mean, every single Friday night, there was a concert given by the BBC Concert Orchestra. And uh, that played everything from Broadway musicals to Viennese waltzes 
to American markets, you know, to the songs from the shows, songs from the movies, big movie themes, the, the entire gamut. And of course, it was all beautifully done, and it was all beautiful music. We didn't stop and say, and now the next piece is by Mozart, and that is so much better than the last piece that was by John Williams. You know, we didn't say things like that. We didn't believe things like that. We took it all for being either good music or bad music. Absolutely. And with uh, growing up in Glasgow, I wanted to ask if Glasgow and Scotland itself has had a, a particular influence or inspiration on your appreciation of music. Um, you, you talked about, you know, the, the Gaelic and the, the songs of um, your, your, your family and friends, but was there something about Glasgow, the environment itself, that's conducive to creativity? Well, the thing is, you know, Glasgow has always had a, a tough reputation, and uh, it, it's because, once again, the media over the last 50, 60, 70 years has concentrated on bad things that have happened there. But Glasgow is, in fact, a great Celtic city. The influx of, of people from the Hebrides in the north of Scotland, you know, who were immigrants within Scotland, but they were but they were, they, they were financial immigrants. They had to come to the big city. And the same thing happened in the north of England. People left the farms and went to the factories. So in Glasgow, they brought their songs and their dances and everything with them, and gradually it permeated the whole of Glasgow. Meanwhile, our Irish cousins were coming into Glasgow as well, and talking their version of the Gaelic language, and bringing their songs and dances and music with them. And it, it was a wonderful mixture. It, it is, until this day. Harking back to what you said there about the popular music of 50 years ago being better than the popular music of now, I have always thought that the introduction of rock rhythm sections into Scottish music, Scottish folk music, um, has almost completely ruined the kind of Scottish folk music that I grew up with. I mean, you can't have someone even singing a Gaelic lullaby now without piano, bass and drums, bass guitar, mm -hmm. you know, everything battering away in the background. <laughs> um, I, I, I find that's a great shame, but that's the way it's gone. At yeah. least pipe bands as pipe bands. I, I don't mean as, you know, two or three pipers getting together, a rock drummer and a rock guitarist. I mean, pipe bands per se remain true to their uh, tradition of music. And it is wonderful. It's, it's certainly interesting to see stylistically there's many bands who have adopted particular elements of you know, Scottish music culture and combined it with the kind of rock aesthetic, as you mentioned, but yeah. all sounding very similar. You know, it's almost an aesthetic here in the US that's very popular. They've got to attract their own generation. You know, an old man like me, <laughs> you know, if I don't like it, I, I tell them I don't like it. But, um, it's a question of my head and my ears you know, are full of Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms and Bach and things like that. But I had the opportunity uh, when I was the principal conductor of the BBC radio orchestra, and that was different to the concert orchestra. The concert orchestra was an orchestra of about 50 odd players. 
And the name tells you concert. They played before live audiences. The big BBC radio orchestra is about 75 players strong. And they were a studio orchestra, you know, like an MGM, big MGM orchestra with great arrangements. I mean, Nelson Riddle and all these people used to write the BBC Radio Orchestra. And I was the conductor of that orchestra. And I played all these wonderful things. So I had the opportunity to work with people like Mel Torley and uh, um, Jack, uh, what's his name? Jack Jones. And uh, oh, so, so many others, so many others like that. And that never in any way uh, worried me about why oh, I'm supposed to be a classical musician, you know, because the next concert I have is Haydn. You know, I could go from Mel Tommy to Haydn very, very easily indeed, because they were both perfect. I wondered if I may, um, and it is very difficult again for me even to know where to start, given the, the massive wealth um, of, of brilliant talent um, that you have worked with. Um, You'll give me a big head. Well, <laughs> maybe deser well, deservedly so, I think, you know, deservedly so. I mean, uh, it's, it's hard. It's a real lady from Glasgow. Hum <laughs> See, there's something about that Scottish humility that's just lovely. It is, it's lovely. But in saying that, you've worked with uh, Shirley Bassey, Alfie Bo, uh, some of the soloists, Julian Lloyd Webber, uh, Nigel Kennedy, Nick yep. Benedetti, Larry Adler, Moira Anderson, Willard White, George Shearing. Yep. I mean, I don't even know where to begin. Um, what I was wondering if you could tell me about and any, if you could pick any experience of working with any of these musicians, if you could tell us about that, where do you begin? <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you a tale. Um, we were doing a concert at the Glasgow Royal Concert Hall with my City of Glasgow Philharmonic Orchestra, which I actually formed. Um, and our guest soloist was an evening with James Galway. So Jimmy said to me, I'm going to play a Mozart concerto in the first half, and then in the second half, I'm going to play my, my pieces. You know, little bits of Irish, little bits of pop, little bits of that. And well, this, of course, was perfect. Now, Jimmy's very, very big in Glasgow. He's very big all over the world. and. Uh, the Glasgow Royal Concert Hall holds two and a half thousand people. And they were, as they say, hanging off the raft <laughs> <laughs> that particular night, you know. Couldn't have squeezed more people into the place. And, uh, oh, the atmosphere was absolutely wonderful. And um, Jimmy himself introduced the second half of the concert. He spoke to the audience between all the pieces. And he made side remarks to me, and I made side remarks back to him. And it was absolutely great. But there was a piece he was going to finish with which wasn't on the program. It was the London Derry Air, or Danny Boy, as we know it better. And a beautiful arrangement for solo flute orchestra. And the lights came down, and the spotlight was on Jimmy. And he played. Anyone who didn't have tears in their eyes, <laughs> you know, with a block of concrete. <laughs> the audience went wild. So as we walked off the stage together, I whispered in Jimmy's ear, I said, you know, if you had just encouraged that audience, they would have all sung Danny Boy with you. And he looked at me and he said, why? So when we came back on stage, uh, Jimmy said to me, uh, Mr. Sutherland, will you get back up on that rostrum of yours now? He said, I want to say something to the, to the people. He said, your man, <laughs> your man has just told me that if I encouraged you, you would all sing Danny Boy. 
Let's see if he was right. Sure he was. That would have been a, a beautiful, th a beautiful thing. The people of Glasgow coming together in unison. That would have been beautiful. It's amazing. There is something very special about that relationship between um, performer and audience, but when they're actually all, you know, together as one, it, I mean, you you will know better than anybody. That's it. Just it can't be beaten. No, it can't be rehearsed. You know, it's just got to happen. Amazing, amazing. Absolutely. Well, that's just one story. <laughs> could keep you here all night with, with stories like that. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll, we'll come back and do this again already. I think this is just the very beginning of the beginning of, of, of me learning. <laughs> you know, I have conducted all over the world, except in America. And uh, one of the things I said to the, to the American Scottish Foundation, I said to Camilla Hellman, uh, if I, if I do have at my great age now, you see, if I do have an ambition left, uh, because we in Scotland grew up with the name of Carnegie, you know, and and the wonderful things that Carnegie did, both in New York and back in uh, Scotland, you know. People might not know that in Dunfermline, where he was born and brought up, very, very poor family. Um, the local park, you know, public park, which we all have in our cities now, the public park in Dunfermline didn't allow working class people through the gates. No. And particularly way. children. They were kept away from them. And Carnegie tells a story of when he was about 10 years of age, his father took him by the hand and said, come on, we're going to get into that park together. And they were turned away at the gate. So when Carnegie returned to Dunfermline as a multi-millionaire, he bought the park. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. So we grew up with, with that, you know, and... The other side of the story is this, you know, in the middle of the 19th century, this wonderful orchestra which had grown up in New York, the New York Phil, uh, didn't have a hall of their own, you know, they had to give concerts in, in other public buildings. And it was Andrew Carnegie who built the hall for the American Orchestra, for the New York Philharmonic Orchestra, to have a home of their own. And in order to give a really big launch, the most famous musician in the world at the time was the Russian composer Tchaikovsky. So we brought Tchaikovsky over to New York to conduct the opening concert. Oh That's God. our Andrew Carnegie from Dunfermline. Long story. You know, I said, I want to bring my Scottish concert. Uh, to Carnegie Hall and to the people of New York and do a tribute to Carnegie in that very hall with the Symphony Orchestra, the New York Film and the best pipe band in the whole of the United States that you can find. Put them together with the Symphony Orchestra and play some of the music that I have arranged for White Band and Symphony Orchestra. And this is the plug now, just on my new album, Hail Caledonia, which you can buy on, on, on Amazon USA. Um, I'm sure there would be literally hundreds of pipe bands desperate to be a part of that event. 